Hello and welcome to uh, Scratch lesson number one, an introduction to the programming environment or the integrated development environment of the Scratch uh, editor, which is on your screen before you right now. This editor or IDE will help you make a program and run it and debug it as you go. So it has several windows that we need to look at to begin with. The first window I want to draw your attention to is the stage which is this upper left window here. This is where your program will run and anything that you programmed will show up in this window. The other window directly underneath it is a sprites window and this is where you can see all the different sprites that are being used in your program. The computer or scratch has a library of built-in um, sprites that you can choose from or later on as you get better you can actually create your own sprites if you see the need. There's also a teeny window on to the very very left here which shows you your backdrop. The default backdrop when Scratch starts is simply a white screen. There's really nothing here. We're later on going to learn how to put some pictures in here and dress up this uh, stage a lot by using a different backdrop but that's for a later lesson. The center window is actually quite an important window. It has three actual tabs. You can choose sounds that you're going to use in your program by clicking on the sounds tab. Even make your own sounds and record your own sounds. Also you can import sounds if you have a neat sound that you want to bring into your program you can do that through this um, position right here. You can change the costumes or the looks of some of your different sprites. This cat which loads by default when Scratch starts has actually two different looks. It has two costumes it's really just one object, um, one item, but it has two different uh, appearances to it which are labeled costume one and costume two. You could add costumes to this sprite or you can make uh, more costumes in your own sprite if you like. And finally the script tab shows you these blocks we call them which are methods or functions that will perform certain actions depending on their description there are many categories of these blocks. There's motion blocks, looks, uh, sound, pen, operator sensing, control, and so on, in including events. We're going to use some of those today as we make a very simple program just to show you how things are done. The programming window on the very right is the window that we drag these blocks into and arrange them in such a way as to perform actions on the sprite that we have selected. Just a just a, a point I want to make right now is that oftentimes you'll have many sprites that are using in a, that you're using in a program and it's very important to know which sprite is selected by this blue box when you're programming because each set of program blocks pertains to or belongs to a particular object. Each object has its own programming code and if you're not careful and you're putting blocks in and setting them up thinking that you're doing it for one sprite you might actually be doing them for another so watch what sprite you're dealing with when you're creating your program. Now with this cat we have it positioned or it shows up more or less in the center of the screen. You'll notice that there are X and Y positions so there is coordinates on this stage and we can define the position of an object by its coordinates. Now the coordinate system, if you imagine this thing as a, just a big piece of graph paper without the grid line showing, uh, you'll see that you can actually, you'll have different X and Y values. Some programs define X and Y to be zero at the very top left of the screen. But in Scratch, the zero, zero position is actually right in the middle of the screen. And I'm going to show that to you right now by actually creating two more sprites these sprites will have really very little purpose except to show you the zero zero coordinate system. So I'm going to go up to this position right here called new sprite. Click on the uh, paint sprite button. You'll see that this window now turns into a canvas where I can create new sprites. I'm going to choose the line sprite. I'm going to make this sprite very simple. And I'm going to draw a horizontal sprite across or a horizontal line across my screen. To make sure it's completely horizontal, I hold down the shift key while I do that, and I pull my um, whoop, I pull my line across. I was holding the wrong key down for a minute. That's a perfectly horizontal line. So I'm going to have this sprite 
uh, show my x-axis. And by the way, I need to define where the center of this sprite is so the program knows. To do that, I use these crosshairs up here. Click on them and you'll see crosshairs appear here. Now these crosshairs can define the center of my sprite for me. It makes sense to put the center of my sprite right about here. And when I click it, the center of the sprite is now defined to be right about there. And I'm going to move it later. I also want to create another sprite. So I go back here and I choose another sprite. It calls it Sprite 3. It defines a name for you, which if you want to, you can change later. And this sprite, I'm going to um, whoop, sorry, not make a new costume. In this sprite here, I'm actually going to draw a vertical line. So I'm going to hold the shift key down again a second time and pull a, a line straight down across my screen. And I'm also going to set its center to be more or less centered right there. If I can get it exact, that's really good. So I've defined the centers of both of these sprites. Now these sprites are pretty elementary, but I can code them. I can provide blocks that actually describe what they do and make them move or whatever else. That's not my intention. My intention is simply to go back, choose this sprite, and make it appear in the center of the screen. So I'm going to go and put some code in that actually makes it appear in the center of the screen. I'm going to go down to the or to the motion category and choose um, set X to 0 and set Y to 0. Now you might think that's good enough but actually it's not because in object-oriented programming languages like Scratch you have to divide def or define an event that will execute this code. An event could be clicking on it an event can be when this object touches another object. An event can be when you press a key on your keyboard. There are many different types of events that can trigger these function calls or these methods, but we have to decide which event is going to actually make this code execute. So if you go back up to the top here, you see these events. And I'm going to make it pretty simple. I'm going to use when the green flag is clicked event, put it onto my programming window, and connect it to my X and Ys. So as soon as I click the green flag, it will now center this horizontal line. So if I do that, there it goes, a center, or this horizontal line centered itself. And I'm going to do the same thing with this vertical line. So I'll just go back, choose the event of the green flag being clicked, and set its X and Y positions to 0 and 0, just like the other sprite. So now, boom, I've just drawn crosshairs or the Cartesian coordinate system onto my stage. This is only to help me illustrate the quadrants and the uh, X and Y coordinates on a stage. You'll notice now that if I put my pointer pretty much smack dab in the middle, the zero, it's at zero, zero. <laughs> it's pretty hard to do because the coordinate system on uh, Scratch is pretty refined, but there it is. If I move my pointer to the right, you'll see the X values get larger positively and if I move my pointer to the left from the center they get more and more negative up to some maximum values uh, that you can see here the X maximum negative value is about negative 238 240 and the positive X value is about 230 some this way positive Y values go straight up and the Y value goes to about positive 180 and the negative Y values are straight down in this region here to about negative 180. So if I'm in this position of my graph, just like in math class, your positive x and y values. Here's negative x but positive y values and so on. So I can define my sprite's position using that coordinate system. I'm going to leave these lines, these sprites, in place just to help us uh, know what coordinates are which. So what I want to do is actually, I don't want a cat in my uh, stage, I'm going to make a simple program where I make a ball bounce back and forth. So I don't want this cat sprite. I can click on the cat sprite right here, right click on it, and choose to delete it, and it's gone. The only two sprites remaining are sprite 1 and 2. I'm going to make a new sprite, or create, or actually not make one, but pick one from the library, which means I come back to new sprite, I choose this icon right here, click it, 
and you'll see that there's a lot of pre-built sprites in Scratch too. The one that I want has to do with sports. I want to pick a soccer ball. I'm just going to double click it and into my screen it pops right here and it's appropriately called soccer ball. Now a soccer ball is an object. Objects have properties and I can see what some of the properties of this ball are if I click this little info button right here. I can see its current position on my screen. It's x is 26, y is 22. It's in the positive x and y quadrant. It's pointing in direction 90 degrees. Now if you remember math class, um, on, most, on most Cartesian coordinate systems, this is 0 degrees here. This would be 90, 180, 270 degrees. In Scratch it's actually designed a little differently where 0 degrees is pointing straight up. 90 degrees in the positive direction is this way, so its angle increases in the positive direction as we go clockwise from that top line to the bottom here, which would be ne or 180 degrees. This would be positive 90 degrees. If I were to move counterclockwise from the zero angle, then there'd be this would be negative 90, and it would go up to a negative 180 degrees over here. So you can pick the direction your sprite is pointing in using these direction angles here. Notice that I can point it down here and I can actually have it pointing at 180 or notice when I have my move this little pointer these are the negative directions in this area here and my soccer ball is changing its orientation. So the soccer ball actually has a front and a back uh, according to the computer even though we see it as just a sphere or a circle and don't usually think of it as having a front or back portion to it. So right now it is actually pointing in the 90 degree direction which is to the very right of my screen in this direction here. If I were pointing it at negative 90 degrees which is about there, it actually is pointing in this negative direction here. So oops, I, I had it a little bit off but that's okay. I'm going to move this back to 90 and you'll see it's actually kind of hard to do I don't like playing with this pointer here because it's really hard to get it to 90 degrees because <laughs> it's just very very sensitive. I think I had it and I lost it. So the heck with that. I'm going to take my sprite and I'm going to say when I click the green arrow to actually make its direction point 90 degrees. There it is. I can always change that. Uh, but I'm actually having a point to the right 90 degrees. So to heck with fooling around with it in the info button here. I'm defining it right here in my code. As soon as I press the green flag, it's going to do that. Okay, heck of a lot easier. Um, now, I'm going to get it to move. Well, there so happens to be a move block. So I'm going to get it to move 10 steps. It's going to move 10 steps in the direction of 90 degrees, which is to the right, when I click this green arrow. So if I do that right now, there it goes moving to the right every time I click the green arrow. That's a lot of work for me to do. Why not have the program do that itself? So to do that I'm going to show you something called a loop. A little bit ahead of myself by doing this but we'll be using them later on. I'll just show it to you now. There's something called a forever loop which to me makes a lot of sense. The program code always executes from the top down so you first click the green arrow, it sees immediately this forever loop, points it in a direction 90 degrees, moves it 10 steps, gets to the bottom of this forever loop, comes right around and back in and does those same code again and again and again forever. Forever loops can be very useful and very powerful but they're also dangerous. They're sometimes called infinite loops that can crash a program. Uh, in this case it won't really happen but you do have to be careful with looping structures. I don't need to define this position as 90 degrees every time I come through here. I only have to do it once so I'm going to point in direction 90 degrees before I go into my forever loop and only have it move 10 steps inside my forever loop. Now I'm going to move it back to here and we'll watch what happens. It actually kind of moves nice and smoothly across the screen and notice that the soccer ball continually wants to move to the right because this script is still executing. You notice it has yellow glow around it. This is showing you that this script has, is still running and it hasn't stopped because we're in this forever loop. So I'm actually pulling it out 
and it wants to keep moving it to the back to the right of the screen because of this loop. I can hit the stop button though and stop my scripts from running so I can you know start doing some work again on them. So there's the soccer ball moving to the right as I wanted it to but I'd like it to actually bounce off this right side of my stage when it gets there to look like it's bouncing because balls typically bounce. So once again I can go back to these scripting blocks and I'm going to pick the motion category go down to this very useful and powerful block called if on edge bounce. This is really useful. We could probably program it to do that ourselves, but this is a piece of code or a series of instructions built into this one block to make it bounce no matter what edge it hits. I'm going to place it inside my forever loop because once this executes and goes into the forever loop, it never comes out of here. It would be pretty silly of me to put it try and put it outside. Can't even do that because this code never leaves this forever loop. I have to put it inside. Now, when I run it, it should bounce off. And of course, it's doing that not only on the right hand side, but on the left as well, which is pretty neat and nifty because I didn't even have to program for that. Also notice your soccer ball seems to shift when it hits. Well, that might be an effect you like, but I'm going to actually have it change that. There is this property where after it bounces you can have it rotate and that's what it's defaulting to right now. I actually want it to bounce and not change its orientation so I click this little blue button so that when the ball bounces off a wall it doesn't flip direction. There's a subtle difference but you notice the ball's image doesn't flip like it was before. That might be a little bit more realistic the way a ball hits a floor if the ball's not rotating. Now how do I get that ball to bounce up and down? Well you probably already know the answer to that. I can come right back over to here and set my direction to be pointing up and now when I run my code it's going to bounce up and down. And when it hits the edges of my stage sure enough it bounces just like I want it to. Now that's accomplishing quite a bit with a very small amount of code and that's why Scratch is a pretty powerful little environment to program in especially to learn how to program. I'm going to stop it right here and I'm going to just uh, take a minute to get you to copy this down yourself. You should also be programming this in, maybe pausing the video occasionally to type or to put the same blocks in positions here so that you have the same code ready to go and save it at the end of the day because our next lesson will pick up where we left off. Thank you for listening.